Hello there, it's Con Murphy here. Across the next few weeks, Balls.ie are delighted to bring you UCL Memories, brought to you in association with Live Score. Now, across four episodes, we look back at some iconic moments from the Champions League with the help of the players and coaches that helped make them. This afternoon, we're going to talk about uh, Shelburne's uh, amazing run in the Champions League in the 2004-2005 uh, season. We're joined by uh, Stuart Byrne, by Alan Coley and by Pat Finlan, who was manager at the time. So three Shelburne greats with us uh, this afternoon. But before we talk about that particular campaign in 04-05, Pat, maybe just from your own point of view, you were obviously your Champions League experience as a player. Uh, I'm thinking back to 2000-2001 beating Slogo Jugo Magnus of uh, Macedonia in the first round before a really interesting tie with Rosenberg in the next round. Yeah, um, I think it was the first time League of Ireland team had, had won away maybe in, in, in a while. Um, I remember the game in, in uh, Macedonia was, was, yeah. was really, really hot. Um, young Richie Baker was very good for us, but it was... Uh, yeah, it was, it was a great win because, like I said, I hadn't been too many wins on the road for League of Ireland clubs, and I'd played in a fair few League of Ireland games with European in European competitions, and um, previous to that as well. So it was always nice to to get a win um, away from home in Europe, in, in Europe even at home. But you know, yeah. at that stage we were still sort of part time, so it was it was a big win. Um, and then obviously we came up against a really, really top team in the next round in Rosenberg. We gave a good of a count ourselves, but just just weren't good enough on the day. Yeah, I remember I was actually at that match against Rosenberg at Tolka Park, and one of the things that struck me on the night was the amount of people from other clubs who were there supporting Shelburne. Like everybody seemed to get behind Shells. They knew like Rosenberg were in those days. They were like a seriously good team. Yeah, they were uh, serial competitors at that level of Champions League football. They'd, I don't know many league titles they'd won in their own, themselves in their own country. So a lot of good players, household names, and they, they, they were they were a really good side. Um, and it's, it's it's probably like a lot of the previous games I would have played in, you know, especially against the really really top sides. That after 50, 60 minutes, someone you think someone's pulled the plug out, and um, because your energy just goes. The lads yeah. probably that as well. That you know you've done that much trying to keep your shape and keep the game plan that it just wears you down and eventually their quality just just takes over and it's probably probably a little bit similar in Deportivo in the away game we, that we worked so hard and that, that quality like just that's a big difference you know you mm. can match teams for periods of times and always felt that as a player in the league that we could match for a period of time but once you got to a stage where you start to fatigue well, then obviously your concentration levels and yeah, your thoughts around the game plan can be a little bit looser and you get picked off too easy, you know. But uh, yeah, but that was a good good campaign. Uh, you know, we'd had we'd had some really good games in Europe with Shells prior to that. We'd obviously had a big game against Rangers in in, uh, in Prenton Park and Oibrox, uh, you know, and with Dermot as well. And probably one thing Dermot doesn't get the credit, Dermot was very tactically astute, really, really good on the game. Um, you know, and, and all them games, we gave a good account of ourselves under them. Yeah, I remember the game in Prenton Park was amazing. Were you, were you two or three nil ahead or something in that game? Yeah, we're three nil up. Three um, we're, we're two nil up. It was Dick Advocate's first game um, as Rangers manager. And they had a splattering of top, top players. Giovanni Brown, Brown Coors, the manager now. George Galberts, Helen Negri, Lorenzo Amoruso, Barry Ferguson. Get two so in midfield. Like, they're the top team. Um, and... I think they were a little bit shell shock. We then went in two and a half half time, and uh, I don't think anybody knew what to do. You know, I think the team talk says, "Jeez, lads, I'm, you know that's it. I don't know what to say now. You've ruined that." <laughs> and funny enough, we went out and scored again to make it three 0 and uh, we just, we just again similar. We just they, the quality they brought on Jonathan Johansson. I think um, in the second half, and he gave us a hard time, and they just got back into the game. We always give Tony McCarthy plenty of stick off too. too Two penalties he caught the ball. I think he's tight. He was playing full back in the, <laughs> team in the, in the second half. But again, that's that's what I'm saying to you about the fatigue, and that's when it kicks in. And you just um, we got we got beaten five three, and then we get a good 
got to count ourselves in Ibrox as well. We lost 2 0 in the end. So yeah. like I said Dermot's, Dermot's games in Europe are always quite good. Like I said, he was really, really on the ball in relation to how to tactically set up, you know, um, because they we were probably only starting to make little strides, I suppose, in Europe in most of the clubs. Yeah, I remember we did that game on the radio, the game at Prenton Park, and Gabriel Egan was on commentary, and uh, we just, we couldn't believe it when you went 3-0 up, it was like, Jesus, is this happening, you know, it was an incredible, uh, incredible night, but uh, pity you kind of ran out. Of- Lad Stewie, um, Alan, do you have memories of those early, I know obviously you weren't involved, but um, did you get to any of those games? I, those I, I remember that particular game, I was actually training at, uh, at Longford at the time, I was receiving Kenny. And we came in and we, I think we finished training at about eight o'clock or something like that, which obviously coincided with half time in the game. And I remember thinking, um, the for, genuine, the first thing I asked was because it was a TV, we used to train out in Selbridge, um, out in, um, it was a golf driving range out there. So there was a, actually ultimate, uh, we ended up training with, with, with Pats there, but long for train there for us. So there was a kind of a little pro shop with a TV. And I remember coming in from training, um, whatever, quarter past eight, and just immediately going to the guy behind the counter because I said, what's the score in the game? He says, it's 3-0. I said, that's over, that's it. Like, you know, Shells are winning 3-0. And I nearly <laughs> I nearly dropped, like, you know. But then uh, the initial impact was, how could that's, like, oh, my God, this is going to be one of the greatest results of all time, like, you know. Um, but that was my initial reaction. But then again, I have to say, part of me went, you know what, like, I had kind of I, I knew I knew Shells were such a good t- team. You know they were the best team in the country at the time, and Pat and everything. And they, you know, you're talking about the team that 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 Rangers had. I think Shells fairly star of the team as well. Like you know, and then part of me thought like, Do you know, maybe I'm not that surprised. Like you know, because there was real quality in there. It was just the sheer. It it was unexpected for a European game for a club, especially against a club like Rangers, to be three 0 down, um, um, at half time. But mm. um. You know, ultimately, you know, I couldn't watch the second half because I had to drive home, whatever. And I got home and found it, it, had, it had totally reversed, like, you know. And um, But it, it definitely stuck with me because I felt it was a psychological thing. Um, and these things are always psychological, in my opinion, Con. I think people started to think, maybe Pat did as a player, I don't know, do you know what? These guys can be got at if you if you approach the game in the right way and, you, and, you, and, you, and things go your way. But certainly, was a, I, I think we got a, li- a big, big lift from it. Mm, mm, it was. Uh, I'm just a bit gutted that you didn't listen on the radio to the second half in the car. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I had no, I had, a, I had an own this on micro, I don't think I had a radio. <laughs> why was Khan, uh, do you mind me asking, Pad, why was the game in Prenton Park that time? I know, obviously, the big rival Rangers or whatever. Was it something to do with that, Pat? Yeah, they just they just decided that they didn't want to bring Rangers to Dublin and um, if I'm not mistaken I think Pat's drew Celtic in the other competition mm. and draw so it was us and Rangers and we were away to we took, well, we were home to Rangers but we were away in Prenton Park Tramier's ground and I think Pat's were in Celtic Park the same night um, which they, and I think they, they got a, two, a nil all draw I think if I'm not mistaken mm. as well so they are actually two decent results but we had two really good dads at the time and ourselves and Pat's were we're going head to head in more ways than one. And, <laughs> uh, the old Pat Dolan rivalry was at the thing. Um, but um, yeah, they were, they were, they, we had two good sides in fairness, a lot of good players around uh, them two teams. Um, but yeah, it was moved. It was moved, I think, from our security grounds. That we had to play it away. We're just disappointing. We mm. had that incident as well years ago um, when Linfield were playing Dundalk. Dundalk, after the yeah. first leg. Second leg had to go to, to the Netherlands mm. because of uh, trouble at the first leg. So. Um, happily, we, we live in happier times now, Pat, as you sit in an office up in uh, Windsor Park. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, abs- <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it was uh, strange times then, all right. Yeah. But, um, it was disappointing to lose home advantage, as you know, as League of Ireland clubs in them days, you, the home advantage is the one you really wanted, you know. But we got a great lift there because the just had about four and a half, five thousand fans there. So it was, it was, uh, it was interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just going back to the Rosenberg thing, by the way, I was looking at their results and they, they knocked Shelburne out, I think, 4-2 on aggregate, which, hmm. um, you know, was probably the difference between the teams. But they went on in the group phase. They beat PSG at home uh, 3-1. They beat Helsingborgs at home 6-1. Hmm. And they drew one all at home to Bayern Munich. So that kind of gives you an idea of the level of that team that you were up against at that point. Yeah, no, they were. They were a top team and a lot of their players moved on in the, in the, in the next year or two. Um 
but like I said, we had a really good team of shells at that stage, and yeah. we, we were part time. So again, that that has an effect when you're like I said, when you're going up against the better sides. It, it, later on, will tell. And with the young Richie Ford in the team that 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 night as well, it was brilliant. He was only. A key, mm. I've uh, seen Richie playing. He physically was able to, to handle himself, and even when he was a kid, and caused him all sorts of problems. But uh, now, like I said, that Rosemary team were were top top class. They did a lot of good players, and the, the years of of competing at that level in the Champions League, had huge experience. And I was lucky enough to go back there. And it just shows you what the finances the European uh, European money can do. I was back there two seasons ago when we went a great uh, run with Linfield, and the stadium is incredible. Training facility incredible. So they've obviously reinvested that they have a bit more of a challenge in Norway now than they've had but um, they've, they've invested the money really really well I wonder lads is Rosenberg an example of what Shelburne were kind of trying to do in the in the mid 2000s you know they're investing big money paying massive wages to the likes of uh, Alan Cawley and Stewie Byrne to get them on board and winning leagues left right and centre and, and pursuing that European dream Alan yeah, I think so, Khan, to be fair. Um, obviously, the one thing I found when I signed with Shells was the level of professionalism. And Pat speaks there about maybe the result at Rangers and Stewie, how, how because they had such a good team and it was a star-studded team, that maybe it wasn't a surprise. But I felt we were always building towards that and maybe towards the Deportivo thing. And obviously with Pat, uh, people talk about maybe the Dundalk team of recent times, Shamrock Overs, and maybe the professionalism that's in the league now we're that has come into it in the last seven or eight years. But the one thing that struck me when I signed for Shells was the level of professionalism that was going on back then. And we had strength and conditioning coaches and Katie used to come in and we'd have training double sessions, whatever the case may be, even in terms of food after training. Or Pat was always trying to do everything possible to make us feel as though we weren't that far away from what we were trying to achieve, I suppose. And a lot of people only look at maybe the last 10 years and obviously Dundalk's success and it's been brilliant and what they've done and um, maybe Shamrock Rovers to a lesser extent with Michael O'Neill. But the stuff that maybe people talk about now that they think has only been going on in the last five or 10 years, that was going on back. Hence the results that we were getting because of the level of professionalism. Obviously, you had very good players as well, Con. But the one thing, Pat, and it's funny you mentioned it there about the fitness levels because the one thing that sticks out for me with Pat's management at the time when I signed, because I was coming maybe from UCD where we were always fighting and, and you'd be lucky to get a result and you'd be hanging in games. Whereas you go to Shells and every week you're expected to win. That's the bottom line. I remember we, we lost two games and it was almost like a crisis at the time. Um, so it was literally flipping from one side of the coin to the other. But I always found with Pat, the one thing he always used to re-emphasize, particularly in league games, was if we play at such an intensity for 60, 70 minutes, Come the last 20 minutes, they won't live with you. And that tended to happen week after week against maybe some of the weaker teams or the part-time teams or whatever the case may be, because we were that level above in terms of the fitness and what we were doing. And it's funny he mentions it, that we were, that was almost the case. Then when we went into Europe, they were at a, almost a yeah, notch up yeah. that they'd be probably, we would match them for 60, 70 minutes and their quality or their fitness levels or whatever the edge they had on us would take over. Like it's interesting, I listened to... Um, the Southampton game against Man City at the weekend and Kyle Walker-Peters did a brilliant interview afterwards. And when you're playing against teams that keep the ball so much, and I can only associate this with the European games because league games weren't like that at all. They were more cut and trust and competitive. But when you went into Europe against better teams, it was a mental challenge even more so than a physical challenge because as soon as you switched off, bang, you were done. Mm. And Kyle Walker-Peters, he gave a great description of playing against Man City. It's a brain game, he called it. Because like that, you're just constantly thinking, looking, movement, fellas in front of you, Grealish, Foden, whoever the case may be, constant um, fluency in their movement. He described it as a brain game. And I always found that in the European games, that the higher up you went, the better opposition, you were just constantly on your toes because of uh, one switch off, bang, the hadja. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, mind you, when you look at the uh, campaign that you had in 04, 05, um, there were a lot of late goals in that campaign for Shells, none more so than in the first qualifying round. You find yourself 2-0 down away in the first leg in Iceland. And I'm sure at that point, I don't know, Pat, whether it was going through your mind, this could be curtains already, but then a great late comeback in that game. Yeah, it was, I suppose we've always, even when we spoke with the lads in this, that was always the game that was a pressure game for us. Um, because obviously the, the resources and the finances we, we were spending as a club to try to, to, to progress the club and make make some sort of a breakthrough in Europe, that forced 
game and my first season as the manager was the, the turnaround season the some winter to summer yeah we got knocked out yeah. by in Zamalda which was a disaster you know, we got knocked out of cup very early so I was on a sticky wicket very early in my material career um, but I always felt that, that that first game we had expectations ourselves as a group as well that we, we fancied ourselves we had a really really good squad we fancied ourselves to have a good run but the expectancy from everybody was that we should be KR Reykjavik and get through to the next round and rightly so um, but they were no mugs neither they were a decent mm-hmm. side uh, their, their football we've seen recently has improved greatly again you know so um, but it was one of them games it was probably nothing in the game for a period and we didn't perform well on the day I'll tell you change the game um, you know but it's just one of them games that we we probably we were probably edgy and nervous in, in that regard and we, and we scraped through there's no point in saying anything different we scraped through and um, but it was probably the relief after that game or so than euphoria of getting through because we always had in the head that we we could make some sort of a, a run in Europe and have have a decent run in Europe. Um, on the back of that is as a manager, you know, well, you know, we're what we're spending needs to come in somehow. Yeah, getting through rounds in Europe is obviously important to be able to maintain that. Yeah, so there's that pressure as well, and obviously your own pride and pressure that you want to you want to progress. You, we'd assembled a real good squad of players, so we felt. We were at the time that we needed to deliver. And in fairness to the players, they were under pressure as well. And then in the end, we did deliver to get to the ground. But it was, it was really, really, two really tight games. Did you change it, Alan? Absolutely, Con. <laughs> no, to tell you the truth, Con, there is a bit of a story behind this. And you mentioned in the intro that Shell's great. I'm far from a Shell's great, right, Con? Let's just get that straight. But there would have been no Deportivo Without me coming on, con, 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 game, con, right? con, con, feel free to flip that lever and flip <laughs> that chair, <laughs> whatever you want. Where is, where is the All right. lever? Greg <laughs> Norton has kept it out of my reach. I can't find it. This is the true con, because without going too much into it, but when I signed for Shells, and it was a big move, and I'm not going over all ground, but Pat signed me, and it was a huge move for me at the time. I was playing for UCD. Shells were the best club, the best team. It was a, a brilliant chance for me to maybe, with aspirations of going back to England if things went well. It started off pear-shaped basically because of UCD put in an objection. And I had done the pre-season, done everything with Pat, flying fit, named in the team against your beloved Shamrock Rovers on the first night in Talca Park. And Pat came to me and said, Alan, I can't play at two hours before the match. And I says, why? And he says, look, they've put in an objection, UCD. Let me just get the game out of the way. We'll sort it out tomorrow and, and we'll get back on the horse. 11 weeks that went on for Con, So there was no getting back on the horse. So basically what happened was, to cut a long story short, we had a brilliant squad, as Pat said, a brilliant team. Pat ended up then, Wes, Wes was playing back in on the right wing ahead of me. I'm not saying I would have ever gone on to do what Wes has done, but I was play, picked in the team ahead of him and who knows what would have happened. But it came, we got it fixed and got it sorted and Pat was amazing and he mentioned Ollie Byrne. Ollie Byrne was absolutely brilliant as well and it stuck by me and we got it sorted out. But it did go on for 11 weeks and by the time I came back then, you were fighting to get back in the team. Yeah. I contributed a little bit in the league coming on in games. But that one, I never let anyone take that away from me, though, Con. I came on in Reykjavik, 2 nil down. And we did. We got back in the game. And it was great because, as Pat said, there was a bit of pressure on it. And everything else unfolded after that. 2 yeah, nil down with seven minutes to go. I mean, it, it did not look good. And then, you know, Alan Moore uh, scored and then an OG a couple of minutes before the end. So suddenly the complexion of the tie was changed completely, Stewie. I I I I've I have a very I have a terrible memory, right, when it comes to a lot of things. But I always find I remember things quite specific to to football games. Yeah. Um, and I remember the away game, and I remember um um the Hadjuk home game as well. But my my memory of that of that game was um maybe this was just me. I don't know. I I I felt we didn't panic. Right now, Pat was right. We 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 gave away two get goals in that game that we would never have given away because we top we top class defenders. I think there was actually two set pieces we got done by as well. Like just not like us, like you know. But whereas in other years, I think we would have we would have um, we probably would have panicked a little bit. And I think back to the disappointment of the Hibs game. I shared that with Pat. Like that was probably that was probably the most disappointing experience I've ever had as a football player was losing really? to them because yeah, yeah. we would have I mean we you know we could have played those guys nine times out of ten we would have beaten them nine times like you know it was just one of them games where we just 
um, everything just went against us on the night, like you know, and it was so disappointing for the team. But I think, I think, and I know I felt anyway uh, that that spurred me on mentally. To, I need, I felt we just needed to go again, and um, you needed to kind of take on board what you're, you're, you're being asked to do, especially when it comes to Europe, because it is a as much a psychological thing as it is anything else. You know, you have to. It's a big change from the domestic football, from being the dominant force in domestic football to playing against teams that you know have a lot of quality. They've always got one or two players that can turn a game um, in the in the um, in, a, in a matter of uh, in a split second. So you have to be so, sort of psychologically ready for that. And I just felt that the couple of years prior to the to 04 kind of prepared us. I I would suggest that um, there were players in our squad. That weren't didn't have that ability to step up and, and mentally go to that to that level we wanted to go to. So Pat addressed that, and I felt going into 04, we'd signed Alan Moore, we had a young Wes Hillan coming through, we had a fantastic squad of players, um, and and the fact that we were able to bring the likes of Alan on when we were struggling is is testament to that. We'd quality to, we'd, we'd we'd quality everywhere, yeah. and the, and despite the disappointing fact of going two 0 down, I felt we didn't panic. And we just we were able to just get, we got ourselves through from whatever whatever way we did we got the two two goals back, and that was to be the pattern for as you suggested con the late goals that was the pattern for for the whole run mm. because the, the Hajik away game was quite similar, you know um but there was just there was a maturity about the team then we just and that game I think we matured we 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 it almost felt like we kept, we we kind of flew home, and we. Got that game out of the way, and I know that the home game was very, very tight as well. But I always felt comfortable in the home game, even though we weren't fantastic again. But um, you could just feel something was starting to come, and 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 all the the years of and um, Alan spoke to you there about the the physical condition and the things from O two onwards. You know, when Pat had taken the role, I was getting I was getting you know um, sheets on on core strengthening from. Um, the Pat had good connections in Middlesbrough. I, I felt we were training the way Premier League players were mm-hmm. training. Um, we were being given videotapes on op- oppositions. We were being asked to watch. All this stuff was just completely out of the blue. And that that's a difficult thing to do when you've come from a part-time um, um, mentality. Like, yeah. you know, but I, I know personally I love that because that was my game. My game was... My game was mental preparation. I wasn't, I wasn't technically gifted in any way. I always had to work on my game, whether it be, you know, um, I would always constantly work on my left foot as much as my right foot, because just to, I needed to, get, to have some sort of advantage. But mentally, it was my game, you know. Um, if you asked me to do something, I would do it. Um, and I knew that was what I brought, had brought to the table. But I had loved that period because it was just, um, it, 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 there was so many different dimensions to just turning up and training. You know, I think that's a lazy way of going about your job. Like, you know, we were being, we were being asked to do extra things here, stay behind and do core work. You know, go into the gym, um, even though I'm sure probably it was an absolute nightmare just to get fellas to do a ten minute core session. <laughs> they were just constantly like Davy, but it was it was it was a good sort of um, you know Davy Rogers. He would always laugh and joke, and he you know even though he'd still do it. But I mean, we were like we were we were like brats, like you know so. Um, but it was the start of something. So it's something yeah. that you take for granted now, Con. These guys don't even have to ask to be done. They just go, they 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 come into training early. If you're training at ten o'clock or in at nine o'clock in the gym, they're doing their stretching and their their core strengthening and all that kind of stuff. You know, mm. it is a professional mentality though, and it was probably the first time, maybe possibly the first time ever in Ireland that that a team had that approach. Which uh, I mean, it paid off. But I'm thinking past. I mean, you were talking about the pressure of getting past Reykjavik financially for the club and and stuff. Um, that second leg at home, having got the two-two draw away, of all the games that you played or you managed in in Europe, there was probably more pressure on you going into that second leg than any other game, really. No, oh, absolutely. Like I said, yeah, the the the, the Hibernian one, as Stewie said, was was a disaster. Um, and we should have we should have won the game easily. We should have won both games easily, but we didn't, unfortunately. Um, so that obviously adds to the pressure. Um. You know, but we 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 had we you know if you look at the two teams from where we were then to the team that we had against KR Ekkevik, well then yeah. we had we had some real quality. You know, people talk still talk about our shells teams. Oh, well, you, you know, you didn't play you didn't play great football. I'm thinking, well, you you, you Joseph, you'd Morsey, you'd Wezo, you'd Ollie Cattle. I mean, in many tackle 
I still need in the team. Mm. Um, and Hayley was Owen Hayley was probably the most attacking fullback, and yeah, anyone can have. So, um, but we had real we had real quality, and it's really a good point. We 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 plenty of experience then, and I think he's right that we, we there was no panic. We always felt we always felt in games, even at home, if we went behind, that we 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 had enough quality to get back into them and come back to Alan's point as well that we. We played at the right tempo it would always it would always take an effect later on in game. So and um, but the pressure that the pressure, you know, from a football point of view was there in relation that you want to progress, you know, we're in the Champions League. There's pressure on us to perform. Um, but you have your added pressure then as well. You want to, you know, as a manager, you know that you need to be progressing and need to be obviously, like I've said before. And it's a bit easier now in the position I'm in. You, you, you realise, you know, obviously the financial aspects of football clubs are, well, because there wasn't, and there still is in huge resources or huge funding or money to coming in from TV deals or not. So Europe, and it's even probably more prevalent now that Europe is so important. Um, yeah. And it was no different. And um, because as both lads said, we had, we had, you know, in fairness to Ollie, when I was the manager, everything that we had asked, he, he came up with. Um, and going back to the likes of strength and conditioning and going away for, for pre-season training and, and trying to change the mentality of part players, full-time players, both on and off yeah. the pitch. Um, and that's difficult, you know, and, but, you know, I always felt that once we established after a year, I always felt the group would manage that because if you didn't, because the players were so good at the level we were playing at, if you didn't get to that level, eventually... They would find you out rather than me have to find you out, and 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 they would move out. or that good a group, and um, so you, you knew that to do all that needs resources. And European football was the was the big big key to 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 bring money into League of Ireland football. On that con as well, sorry, just to jump in when I signed because I I came from UCD. Obviously, I was only twenty one. But the one thing, even going into the dressing room, Shuey speaks about the experience and Pat. The one thing I found, I was going in with men. So oh, every lad, every, ma- every person in the dress room at the time, they were like physical specimens in terms of um, their physique, but also then, Stewie, as he mentioned, about not panic and stuff, there was a maturity about them. Yeah. So you had kind of Rogers at the back, experienced player, Steve Williams, experienced goalkeeper, own experienced captain, Stewie and Jim Crawford in the middle, so much experience between them two. You had Ollie on the left, loads of experience, Jason Byrne. So throughout the team, you might have only had the one or two young lads mixed in with nine or ten experienced lads. Whereas you look at the, the league now, I know the whole thing has changed and the landscape has changed, but there are a bunch of kids that play on a Friday night now with most teams. Mm. Um, and I think that stood us in good stead as well going into them games because even as Stewie mentioned coming back on the plane, the one thing Pat, there was huge demands that Pat put on us, but there was also a humility about the group that they never got carried away. No matter what we did, no matter what result, there was never anyone getting too big for their boots or getting above their station. I think that came from Pat as well because of the hunger he had. But um, it was just a brilliant, for me as a young lad coming in, experiencing that, it was a brilliant time to be around. And like I often mentioned speaking to people as well about, I went to England as a young lad and, and the level of professionalism and what it takes to be a footballer. I never knew what it took to be a footballer when I went to England. I was only 16. I thought it was just based on your ability and you go out and play and the best will come through and that's it. But so much, there's so much more to a con in terms of your attitude, your approach, what you're doing off the pitch, how you're looking after yourself. And it was only when I signed with Shells, with Pat, and what the environment that he had created and living with Ali Cal and Dave Rogers that I learned actually how to become a professional. And from then on, I, not saying I lived my life bad before, but I just wasn't doing the things I should have been doing. Whereas once I went in with Pat and the team and the dressing room, going forward, no matter what club I was with, I was trying to live my life like the, the habits that Pat had given us. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that nil all draw on the second leg, obviously the away goals were enough to put you through and the start of a, an amazing uh, UEFA Champions League campaign. By the way, um, just a little reminder that uh, residents in the Republic of Ireland can watch every Champions League game for free on the Live Score app. That's every single uh, game. So the draw for the second qualifying round is made, and Hajduk split come out of the hat from Croatia top team. Uh, Stewie, when that draw was made, what was your reaction? Um, the, I knew like it, it was it was it was exciting. You know, as a player, to be to be getting through, to, you know, to to to, to the um, the next round. I remember, um, I, for some reason, it sticks to my mind what Damien Richardson had said about them. This is this is this is just again one of these strange 
memories you have of something like you know i knew they were the top team they were and i knew they were regular champions league um um contenders but i remember damien rich you know damien rich had had said this is a serious team you know um and i don't to be fair to damien i don't think he was i don't think he was suggesting we didn't have a chance i think he was just trying to reiterate how good a team uh had to actually were um because at that stage i'm not too sure how aware the Irish public would have been of Hadjik split, mm. okay? But certainly, um, from our point of view, you know, you are immediately you're thinking of Croatia, which is like, uh, you know, when you when you think of the history of the country, um, h- highly technical players, um, probably as good as you're going to get as well in 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 Europe, um, but uh, to be quite honest, as soon as we knew who who we who we were playing and. We were going to be away for us. It was just literally pure preparation. Just we were. I think at that stage we were in the mould of we just got to get focused on it. This is this is the hurdle we have to get over. How do we get over that that hurdle? And again, um, you know when you're when you're in the um, you know when you're playing domestically and you're playing in Europe, there's two. Th- you know there's 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 a, there's different things going on at the same time, uh, con because you know we in terms of the domestic games we were you know uh we were league champions we were at a stage where i felt we could manage that we knew um the importance of every domestic game and we knew how to approach it what we where we lacked a little bit was preparation for our games on of the caliber of playing hadrick split yeah. away and then you're thinking how do we get these to talk park so that we're in with a shot of going through. What do we have to do to um um to to get a result? So you're just purely focused on you. You might even be focused on the first half. How can we get to the to half time? What do we need to do? So it's just pure. It's pure. It's pure pre- preparation. And again, it's that mind game. And a lot of players have to change their game con. Like it's not a case of just being, go out and play the way you normally play. We all had to um. To, you, you had to accept as a player you've been asked to do a job and to any footballer who's let's say we, you know we're, we're the top players in ireland like you know you're effectively being asked listen see that ego you have mm. put it in your pocket put it in your pocket for 90 minutes and do this and i think we had a group of players that would do that and that's very difficult um and this is pat's credit very difficult to get a full squad of players to think that way, especially in Ireland and especially at that time when, again, you would had come out of a part-time mentality, you're trying to come into a, a full-time mentality. A very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and I've seen it. I mean, I've seen, you know, the messing that goes on and I've seen it firsthand how difficult it is to get effectively young men to grow up. Yeah, you know, to, yeah. and just to, just to think differently. So, you it know, when you're being asked, comes back to the point Alan was making about so many mature characters in the dressing room. I really. think so. Ah, uh, yeah. I, you know, there's no doubt about it. Like, you know, that 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 group of players just had something. You know, um, had that sort of that focus. Um, and that and they wanted to change. They said, you know what? I don't want to just win a league title. I want. I want to. I, I want to. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to try and be part of. Um, be part of of, of history. Be part of a legacy. And, and look back and say, well, it's you know, we 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 did our bit, you know. Mm. How so daunting I, was the I, atmosphere out there, Alan? Oh, well, yeah, I was just I, just on what Shuey was saying yeah. there. I think a lot of it comes back as well, Con. To and I know Pat's on the call, and I love Pat, <laughs> <laughs> but as a manager, it comes back to he was the manager to get everyone to buy into what he was trying to do. It comes for, comes to him back to pad and the demands because I look at managers now in the modern day and I know the game you might argue is slightly changed but I don't think enough managers put enough demands on players nowadays whereas in that squad everybody knew that if you weren't doing your bit or pulling it or as Pat said the players that eventually find you out Pat and Eamon Collins would have found you out and it was as simple as that so you either shape up or, or, or forget about it so um, I think that's to, that's to Pat's eternal credit and, and, and that should be noted as well not just the fact that there was good lads or good mature lads or whatever the case may be. He had to assemble it all together and make it work, which it did. But the three things that stick out for me about the Hadjik split game, Con, is the night before and the build-up to the match, and they were pulling all sorts of shenanigans on us. But whatever about Stewie sleeping in his big lovely room in his lovely bed, I was sleeping in a cot <laughs> that night, Con, right? Because I was sharing with Owen Heary and Jamie Harris. 
and they had the two big lovely fancy beds and I was in a little cough that you get in Hollis Street Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing. The second thing was, I think we got to the ground really early for whatever reason. Normally you'd arrive an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes before the game. But when we arrived, there must have been 10,000, 15,000 in the ground already and the place was, when we went out to walk the pitch and whatever, the place was absolutely bouncing and as much as that can be intimidating and daunting and it was, it was also amazing for us going over there as well, Con, against this team that everybody knew had such quality but the support and the atmosphere, it was absolutely electric because I've often made the point about the European games that we played in over the years, no matter what club, I always found the only time you felt like a footballer in Ireland was when you were involved in Europe because the whole country was sitting up taking notice of what was going on rather than just the maybe League of Ireland folk that would follow your results on a Friday night or go to the games. Mm. So to go into the ground, and it was absolutely amazing. Um, a brilliant game as well. And as you said, we, we were behind. And the last thing that sticks out in my mind, and we, we touched on at the start in terms of maybe the fitness levels and we always went to the end. And Alan Moore had such a brilliant contribution throughout that run. And Morsey popped up with a brilliant goal mm. near the end. And it was almost as if I felt even, because I was on the bench and watching on, and we went mental when the goal went in. But it was almost as if we had them rattled and that late goal went in. And it gave us such confidence going into the, going into the second leg. Because as Shuey said, we had, to, we had to find a way of maybe keep, not, not just keeping the tie alive, but mm. getting them back to Talca Park thinking, okay, we don't really fancy going back to Talca Park. This team are, are, are really going to put it up to us. And I felt after Morsey's goal and we came off the pitch and there was a bit of needle and there was words exchanged. Bit there was of a bit of a scrap, was there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stewie, yeah, you can ask Stewie about that because he was heavily involved. In <laughs> uh, it was not, no, Con, it wasn't. I, for, <laughs> the, first of all, the game, so I've never played in a game with an atmosphere that I couldn't hear a thing. I couldn't hear a thing. I couldn't. I couldn't hear the sideline. Didn't know what was going on. And to be fair to them, they had real quality. And they we scored early. Glenn Fitzpatrick, an absolutely outstanding uh, a goal, as good a goal you see at any level. Um, and they just came at us like a like a tsunami. And we had to we had to weather a serious storm. Um, and I think, thank God, our preparation was such that we were just able to. We were able to manage ourselves a little bit. We, you know, um, we could have literally lost the game in that first half. I felt anyway, um, and we just needed to kind of get to half time and to be able to to the, to to kind of um, settle ourselves down a little bit and um, and and just you know again you're talking about trying to manage the game and get it, get out of there with, with a result. Yeah. Um, and the second half was the same. They kind of, they, they 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 put us under huge huge pressure, but ultimately. What was different this time around than other years was that we had the quality. And Alan says, Alan Moore, like you know, you've got like you've got you know this guy who's just uh, has just quality coming out of his ears. To be quite honest with you, you know, calm and collected, quiet, um, had a little bit of nastiness about him as well, which is which 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 I always love, but just pure quality con. And he just out of nothing, just a little a little torn and a, a gorgeous finish and so on and. And and th- yeah, there was a little bit of a scrap afterwards. Um, I think Jamie Harris might have um, sorted their their skipper. That was was, there was just trouble on the pitch, and they lost it. You see, Con. I think that's where we kind of so like, see to every game. And again, you know, there's a lesson in this as well in, in European football. I've I would be, I would have been critical in the past. Let's say that teams would have rolled over a little bit psychologically to the European teams or didn't use to their full advantage that their physical attributes you know yeah whereas we didn't you know we just we said no we're not having it like you know and there was more there was there was more on the pitch there was more on the tunnel going off but that was their way of saying do you know what you know we're not backing down and you've got to come to dublin um in um, next week so let's see let's see how you get on you know yeah so pat you probably weren't too disappointed when you saw that kind of stuff going on at the end because it kind of it Put it up he loves all that. He he yeah. he, he, he <laughs> taught us to do that. Yeah. He taught us to do, do that. It was probably one of the best nights. And people talk about the Deportivo game, but the Hadjur, the two Hadjur games for me were the best nights. The game away from home was fantastic. Mm. I, I spoke to someone on the day, and he had told me that they, you know, two or three hours before off, they'd have ten to twelve thousand in the stadium. And you know, and when we got there, the place was absolutely rock. And I knew the players would get a lift out of that because, as a player and as good players, that's what you want. I didn't go back to. The two, the key aspects with, with, with this group of players was to always keep putting demands on them. 
that was the key to it is is if you get to a point where you think yeah well, i'm now at the level well, okay well let's can you go forward or are you, are you, can you get better or whatever it is whether that's training whether it's the strength and conditioning whether it's diet nutrition you know always have demands on them to see can they can they keep progressing and like i said that group always did um and we got better and better as they went along but the one thing that stands out for me with the Hadjok game is oh, I haven't seen a performance from a player like he did that night from Glenn Fitzpatrick. He was absolutely brilliant. He gave them a tour of time. He had mm. looked brilliantly for us. Um, he was he was he was different class because I think we played Jason Wyatt that night. If I'm not yeah. mistaken. Wyatt the right, yeah. Wyatt on the right. Um, and again, Jason, like Stewie said earlier, Jason's obviously the top striker in the country, along with Glenn Crow at the time. And in European games, we said, and that's Go and get yourself wide and right because we wanted him in the team because obviously he, 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 he might nick you a goal at some stage. Yeah. Um, and again, his work rate in that position was fantastic. But I felt we, if that had been a few years previous to that, we'd have lost four or five one because we'd have ran out of steam. There's no doubt, Brad. We kept going. I think we, I'm not mistaken, I think we threw Jeremy McCarthy on maybe with about five minutes to go and it was a different, different type of threat. Um, and Morsey then got a great goal. But I think that what happened at the end was that. Jamie Harris, I think, slipped and stood on their captain's head <laughs> on, the, on the far on the far side of the pitch, and he opened him up with a, a serious gash in his face, and they were not happy about it coming in. Uh, and then the tunnel, or if I'm not mistaken, there was a walk of about about four miles. Yeah, yeah, it was one of them. Yeah, there was a track around the pitch, <laughs> it and was, all uh, it kicked off under the under the stadium, and um, it was it was tasty. I have to be honest, you know, I wasn't involved, and there was too many big lads there, but. It was, <laughs> It was, uh, Big Derek. And, and and we knew, we sort of, when we got in the dressing, you know, obviously our lads were, were, were so, so up from already with the result and getting the, the second away goal, we think. But we sort of had it, it won't fancy coming to talk, you yeah. know, we sort of knew that at that stage that they had lost the reason with each other and they lost the plot. And the, like I said, the tunnel incident sort of probably just added to all that. And even when they got to talk for the second leg, you knew they, they weren't, uh, they weren't overly happy with it. You know, for them, it wasn't, for us, it was a great pitch, great stadium at the time. But for them, um, not that their stadium was was mm. it was for sort of an old, bigger stadium or a track around it. And, but they, they wouldn't have been they wouldn't have been used to the toy pitch, the confines of of uh, Talca and the full house as well on the night. So yeah, I was at the match, and I, I mean, it was probably one of the great, great European nights for any Irish club. Um, yeah, you know, and. What a great piece of management from you to tell Dave Rogers to go out and score a worldie. Uh, I, think, I think as a manager, yeah, as a manager, and I've said this before, probably there's there's nights and, and games where things just go against you. Hibernians and Malta is probably yeah. Well, Hadjok was probably the night where we the game plan just walked to a tee. The goal, Rogers' goal is you know there there are things that can happen in matches, but that was you know was sort of listen. You, you, you got to be careful here. We need, we, we know we need a go. We don't need to get it. We get it with 10 minutes to go, whatever the case, just be, you know, key to the game plan. We actually played well on the night. I thought played really well. Um, and we knew we had a bench as well. I think Joseph was on the bench that night. So we knew we, if, if, if things were getting, you know, where we had to throw the kitchen sink or a little bit that we had the players capable of doing that. And we knew the crowd was there, but it was important that we didn't concede um, and that we, 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 you know, we were, we were nice and solid and, like I said, the game plan just worked out well. Rogers' goal obviously is um, only for him to score it because we, we still the end of it. Um, <laughs> but, and, and and even the second goal with with, with Morsey and, and Stewie's right. Alan Alan Alan's quality at that level. You just seen him. You know, Alan at UCD away or Longford away. Not being disrespectful, he, Alan. You know, did what he had to do. But when you put Alan up against better players. Be seeing the quality because he knew he was as good as any of them, and he was. Alan Moore was a fantastic player. Probably, obviously, played at a really high level. Um, but what a footballer! And as she said, really calm, collected, no nonsense about him. But that, it, as well, like he could look after himself and handle himself because he played at, at a really good level in England. But, uh, but even that bit, the second goal, you're sort of saying to Joseph, "Listen, get on, kill the game for us, take the corner, stick it up your jersey, do they have just, just manage the game." And typical Joseph decides in. I'll go and take on three or four of them down the right hand. It was one of them nights, I have to be honest, just one of them nights where everything clicked. And and that's that's very, very rare in football. Very, very rare, I can tell you that. That's my manager's point of view. That's my memory of the game because I mentioned Con 
when the, 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 of, the, of um, I have these memories of football matches and yeah. the the the, the Reykjavik game away, and the Hajduk game at home was the one. I, I've never been so comfortable in a game, uh, you know. And to, um, I can, you know, to be playing against the caliber of team you're playing against, and to know what was at stake. And I just felt I don't. It was like the Zen moment. We were just totally in control. I don't, I don't know. It was maybe it was the, it was the it, we had gotten to that stage. It was all those years of the disappointment um, that you know you, you learned and you learned, and we were just in in such control. And I remember even I remember even 50, 60 minutes gone. We're going to get one. This is coming. This is coming. You could just feel we're just this is coming. Um, it's a bit like escape to victory. You know the final scene, of the match. It was just that you could just feel like a, a, a moment was coming, and as, you know, there was it, 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 the goal was, oh Lord, oh my! Like he, like to be fair to Davy, like they, like we we always talk about Davy because he was the messer, he a bit of a messer, and he'd be a bit, he'd be a bit of a whinge and all, like you know. But tell you what, he could play, he could play, and you, and you, you know, you, you, um, you, when someone. Uh, you know, can play as well as you can play. You kind of you, you forgive all the other things. Like you, know, you can be great crack as well. Like you know, but sometimes you could be annoying. But he, he could he could play football, and he had that in the light in his locker. To be fair to him, he he did. Didn't think it was gonna. You know, I was right behind him for the goal because I was the first to grab him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the first to grab him, and my lord. I'm, I'm glad. What a I'm special glad. Goal. I'm glad. Con Shuey brought that up because you shouldn't be surprised. I know people looking in from the outside, maybe Davy Rogers, centre half, scoring a goal like that. And it was, it was a one in a million, unbelievable. But as Chewy said, he could play. I lived with him at the time and there was ups and downs and all sorts. But see, in terms of him as a footballer, and you look at lads now, and I know the game has changed in terms of centre halves getting on it and their distribution and playing out from the back. Davy Rogers was as good as anyone I'd seen back then, even at the time, in terms of the football side of his game and the technical side of the game. He had a lovely left foot real clever brain about the game. And technically, it shouldn't surprise you that he scored that volley because, he, as Stewie said, it was in the locker. Um, as he also said, when we all ran over to the corner and after maybe two or three seconds of all the jubilation and then we realised who it was, I was like, oh my God, we'll never hear the end of this. So a few weeks after, thought, I'll tell you a funny one now while we're on, while we're on, the, on the goal. I was living with Davy and Ali Cal. So... After a few weeks when all the, the euphoria had died down and we were out of Europe and whatever, um, Davy was over clearing out a little cupboard in the, in the room one Saturday afternoon. And myself and Ollie Carl were watching the telly and the scores coming in on a Saturday or whatever the results is, as, we were, as we normally would. But a lad called around who was a fan at the time, and I think you know him, Con, it's Dave O'Connor. He's done a lot for the club now and yes, uh, yeah, fundraising. Yeah. And he was only a young lad at the time, but he used to pop in the odd day for a cup of tea and chat and he loved shells and loved the club and all. So we were all sitting in one day anyway, having a cup of tea and Roddy was clearing out the cupboard, right? So we were passing a heat and Ollie was chatting myself and Davy. And then out of nowhere, Davy, Davy Rogers walks out into the middle of the sitting room with the boot, right? <laughs> and stands in front of us, Con, right? He won't mind you. He won't mind me telling you this. Stands in front of us. He goes, there it is, lads. Just, just, just the boot that scores a million pound goal, lad. <laughs> uh, Honestly, I have that memory of Davey. He was such a funny character and, and it was an unbelievable goal. It really was. It was absolutely amazing. And it was almost like when I think back at that run in Europe and all the memories, I'll never forget him coming out with the boot and there it is, lads. <laughs> Well, I mean, he's right in a way, isn't he? I mean, the million pound boot, because it put you into the um, third qualifying round draw. You were only one match away from the group phase and you drew Deportivo La Coruña, who were a, a really, really great team at the time. You might have, I mean, when the draw was made, you could have got Juventus, you could have got, if I'm not mistaken, I think Manchester United might have been in that draw as well. I'm not 100% sure about that, but, you know, you would have, you were going to get a really good team one way or the other. So Deportivo, you know, that was going to be a, a big mountain to climb. Yeah, I think there was a possibility. There was there was three or four top teams in there. And uh, I think Deportivo had got to the semi-final the year previous and Porto had beat the Mourinho's Porto. Um, but listen, you, you, you get you, we're at that stage where you're just looking at the draw thinking, doesn't matter who it is, it's going to be top, top class and it's going to be a huge challenge. Um, you know, to go and play a Spanish team, obviously, at that level, football is brilliant for the players as well. So, 
And but again, we when the draw came out, it wasn't you know we 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 were focused on it as well. We we felt we felt yeah. chance. We, we you know we, we, sometimes people think oh well, you've gone against the Spanish, but we did. We we honestly thought like I said yeah, after the Reykjavik game, we've got huge confidence and belief in the group. And then obviously on the back how they performed against Hajduk, um, you know having to put dig in and really scrap for in a way when we played really well in the home leg. And the home leg was was a really good European performance where we managed the game, got the goal, then got them on the counter attack to kill them off. You know, normally that would have happened against us. So mm. confidence, you know, that gives to the players. And like I said, we're all just looking forward to the draw at that stage. If the only downside to that when I look back at it is that if, if we had been where where it is now in relation to the rules, we'd probably be in the group stages of a, of another competition after that, you know. So yeah, um, it's yeah. just it's just for the for the players' point of view as well. Um you know, and, and the, like the build-up to, to Deportivo, I was still playing Hajduk for me at home was, was the game that I always remember from that run. Uh, but the build-up to Deportivo was 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 uh, was mm-hmm. difficult to manage. I have to be honest. From from my view, you had the Sky Sports cameras following you yeah, around you, and all you, that you, sort of stuff. You, you had everything. You you had all sorts going on. You tickets. You it was just something that air players weren't used to. You know, we we're going to play in Lansdowne. You know, you know players getting tickets and as a manager thing and just want to get them onto the pitch and yeah. the ground get them ready and, and play where we also knew that we had to have the point where they have to enjoy this you know um and embrace it yeah so managing that was and again it was a totally new new experience for the players but also a new experience for the manager and the coaching staff and mm-hmm. um, we had great staff at the time and and, and they managed it really well there was no chance of playing that game at Tolka, was there? I mean, obviously no. there was a huge interest in it, but financially for the club, it had to be at Lansdowne, did it? Yeah, I, I, I don't think even from a, a, a licensing point. Oh yes, yes. Stage for that late stage of a European competition was was going to be uh, fit for purpose. So I think it was all going to be Lansdowne Road. Um, and rightly so, it was it was it was you know at that stage it was. I think it was it was cut. It was I think it was thirty three thousand for the game or thirty four thousand maybe on the back of. I think there were seats installed for yeah. two ends of the stadium as well, like internationals at that stage with no terracing. So, but it was um, it was just a special special time for for everybody. I suppose the players are, uh, you know, you're getting a chance to pitch with against some really top top players coming out of a top league in Europe, and uh, it was a dream from from that point of view. And first, the home game was 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 a really good performance, you know, because we we were up against a really top team. Yeah, nil all draw at Lansdowne. I mean, very creditable. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, we probably won real chance, if I'm not mistaken, in the game. Um, in Morsey's the header was it? Yeah, Morsey's header was a decent chance. Yeah, Morsey, Morsey's header, and then we probably a chance in the second. Uh, Jason's header, I think, as well. Jason's yeah, early when it was nil all. Um, but again, that was it, it. It was similar. It was you know, game plan was obviously stay in the game. Can we get the Spain stay in, stay in, stay in the toy? And the longer it goes, obviously, the more, the more it was a. Probably a reversal of KR Reykjavik the longer it goes, where there's a possibility you can get late in the game and a goal could knock you out, well, then they would be they would be the ones panicking at that stage. So but then, to be fair, I don't know what the lads think, but the quality, the quality that they had just came through in the end. They, they, they had real quality players. And but I think it was the night for me that Wezo came of, of age. That's what that's actually what I got out of the game. <laughs> he was uh and, and it, 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 the thing with Wesley at the time and, and Dermot it was Dermot introduced Wesley went to the team. It wasn't me, he was in the team before I got the job. And and we used to try to find a place to play him. You know, you play him wide in a, he was predominantly left footed, play him wide in the right, and you come in off the line and he was he was difficult to play against. And he was just a free spirit. But I thought the night that then two nights for Wesley for me was was when he became a top, top player because he, he he didn't shirk anything. I don't know, you know, Shuey and Alan might, might have something different. To say. Well, I, I, I to get on the ball against yeah, such a that, good team at such a young age. Just said mm-hmm. to me, this boy's gonna play because he's no fear. That was that was it. I I I, there, I, like, it? I hadn't really taken much notice of where's up until that game, even though mm-hmm. he was my teammate and I knew what he was capable of. But to be to be fair to him, he was a little brat. Like he was. <laughs> he, he he needed he needed a slap every now and then and. But he was a young kid, you know. He yeah. grew, came up in inner city, and then we, we 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 all went through those stages. But um, sometimes you wanted to shake him, and and you know. But like, there are ways that you need to get the best out of players. And um, that was the, like that night. I was the, I was um, doing a man marking job on Valeron, so I was the sitting midfielder, and I'd Alan Moore and and and, and Wes in front of me. I actually I was, thought Joey, Joey Valeron would be on this. <laughs> <laughs> here he is. Here, get over here, you, will you? 
<laughs> it can. You can take him out of your pocket now. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I spent the game. I was looking like, where's going? Oh my god, this kid is ridiculous. I, I genuinely can. I said he's not even going to make it to the away game. That's how good he was. I said he's gone. This is it. this kid's gone. To, to this, if anyone is wa- if anyone is watching this game, this kid is gone. Mm-hmm. End of story. Like you know, and- the one thing with that as well, Stu. Like I, I can't even with Wezo. I, I first came across Wezo under fifteen with Belvedere, and because of his size, he was amazing. Then he blew me away the first time I ever saw him, and he was half the size of what he is now. And he was never getting picked for any of the schoolboy teams, the Irish teams. And I used to be always asking the question, more so to the Dublin lads, because I didn't really know them. And I was coming up from the country saying, why is he not pick, getting picked? What's, what's wrong? Like, and I would always used to filter back to his size. Then when I used to play against him, when I came back to the League of Ireland and he was, started to, he was running amok, and, um, but he was never getting an opportunity to go away. And then I signed for Shells, same thing. He was absolutely amazing. I used to come home in the car with Ollie Call and we'd have conversations coming home in the car just about what Wezzo was doing in training. And Ollie would tell you that himself. He was unbelievable. But when you think of what he's gone on to do, and as Pat outlined, and Stewie, that match in particular against Deportivo, Brazilian international, Mauro Silva, I think yeah. he was marking, Valeron in the team, Tristan, um, the winger, what's his name, um, that okay. signed for Newcastle, yeah. The quality of, uh, that they had on the, on the pitch that night, it, 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 would have, it would have almost been a travesty in Irish football, I know people talk about maybe the lack of caps, but can you imagine if he never even got on to do as much as he's done now? Like when you think of the performance that he brings, because to me, people talk about, and, and I know it's wrong to maybe judge players or eras and some of the great players we would have played against and Paddy McCourt, Joseph, these names pop up. But to me, Wesley was head and shoulders above any player I have ever seen in the League of Ireland. He was absolutely amazing, Con. Wow. And I mean, the size thing, you know, Diego Maradona, um, it wasn't exactly a, a giant Lionel Messi isn't either. You know, if you've got it, you've got it, no matter what size you are. Now, th- thankfully, that attitude has changed over the years here and there's a more focus on the technical side of the game for young lads as well. So Wesley had to overcome that as well, Con, which was difficult. Mm-hmm. People think, like, we, we speak a lot about Pat having a great team and great squad of players, but the biggest thing about that squad of players and, and more so in the likes of Wesley, the mental side of the game and the things you have to overcome and for Wesley to overcome all those obstacles and hurdles that were put in his way, the ability was never in doubt or never in question. Nobody would ever doubt that. But people used to look and say, is he strong enough? Is he big enough? Can I put him in there? Can I play him there? And and he had to overcome all that. There's a, there's, yeah, and that's that's exactly it, Alan. I think, I think um, you, you have to put yourself in Wes, Wes's shoes where he must have been so frustrating for him. So frustrating because he had all the ability in the world and he must just constantly getting snubbed and probably wondering why, like, what do I have to do here? And he probably got a little bit disillusioned. You know, he probably, you know, lost a little bit of focus. And I think that European run was his chance to maybe, because he didn't start off in the team. Am I right, Pat? He, he didn't yeah. play in all the games. And it was like a little way of saying, you want if you want this lad, you, here's your chance. Mm-hmm. And it's like you just said, no problem. I think, I think, no and I think that's, go back to, to Stewie's point where, uh, Stewie called him a brat. I think I don't think I ever. <laughs> I think I think with, with Wes, you know, you, there, there's players and the boys allowed us from being in the dressing room. There's certain players that I would have had to deal with in different ways, um, and and it was, and it's completely different now. I understand that, but the one thing with Wesley, the only thing that affected Wes was not playing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, like Wes wasn't earning enough money for a fine to make a difference to him. He just played football for the because he loved playing football. He'd come up on his bike to train. The lads will tell you to leave his bike and, the, and go out and train. Wouldn't stretch, wouldn't do anything. Core, core strength, strength conditioning, nightmare. Absolute nightmare. But what he wanted to do, once he got on a training pitch, like he was he was incredible. And he was as strong, he was as strong as anybody else. Physically, well, he was able to look after himself. He had that core strength and natural strength. But the only thing that that upset him or annoyed him or maybe got him again the demand on him was not playing at times mm-hmm. you know if you're not going to toe the line so be it but and that's I think you know from that point of view Stewie's probably right where he, he, it might have been the case will I show you more so than anything else <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, but I just felt them games sort of to me showed how good a player he was um, because he had been he'd been brilliant for us in some of the games and the league games and that but when he got on, when he got to that stage, and, and and even you know in Spain where 
we weren't we weren't obviously did a lot of the ball. We weren't under huge pressure all the time, but he was so brave. He just you know take the ball in that in that in in in, in that environment for a kid like was was fantastic and his quality as you all know about his quality, but um. And it's probably the one thing, like Stewie said, that came out at was was the performance of Wes, and and we probably knew then that he probably wouldn't be around for too much longer, you know. Nil all for about an hour in that second leg before uh, Deportivo went on to score three goals in the end. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering that wasn't a case of you guys kind of running out of steam physically, was no. it, or was it just no. that they were so good? Or what was no, it? we 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 had a chance. I think you said earlier on, Jason. I think Jason. A, a chance with his head where the ball came in. I think it may have come in the right hand side. Was it? Or, I can't remember. It was that long ago. But he, I think he came in for the left pass. Was it left? And and he yeah. was up. He was just. He was heading it coming down, more than heading it in. You know, in in rising up or meeting in in, in the air. He was on his way down when he headed that, and he just never got real great connection with it. Listen, we didn't have loads of chances, and they. Had, but the quality they had. Um, yeah, I think the quality in the end just. I don't, you, 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 Remember, remember it's still, it, it's hook. still, Pat, it still took a worldie of a 30 yard strike. Uh, it down. Yeah. Alan, yeah. For, it was 35 yards. Yeah. I mean, yeah. con, con, we, we, we came in half time, we were comfortable. Um, at half time, we really said, you know, this is it now. Keep just, let's don't panic if they score because yeah. we, we have to score anyway. Yeah. yeah, so when they scored. We were we were a bit sloppy, but they scored. I don't remember us panicking because because we no. had talked about it. And said we still had to score anyway, so it doesn't matter that they scored. But my God, that goal that Victor scored is probably the best goal I've ever seen in, in real football. He just absolutely just ping on top corner from 35, 40 yards out, mm. and I it was then I went, oh Lord, we don't have anyone that can do that, like you know. And it was just an absolute sucker punch. And they just got a massive lift then, didn't they? they yeah, the yeah. Crowd, the crowd Suddenly got the crowd, the crowd or, or, yeah. put us on their back foot then for a, for a, for a period of time, you know. But the, the quality they had was was what well, well done us in the end. I don't think we ran out of steam or ran out of or got fatigued. We just we just came up against a better side, and in the end, we weren't able. To, we we needed to hang on to the last ten minutes. <laughs> They, they scored a free kick. Pandiani yeah. scored a free kick, the toward free kick. I'd rule it out completely because Willow got beaten on his side. But yeah. I think Willow had been so disappointed by the goal that he just a, bit, a little bit shook by it all. Like, you know? And we just we just lost. That, that, that sort of focus just took a little bit of a, a dig in the stomach. And I think it just, I think the third yeah, the goal second, glossed over. The second goal the was second the, the killer. killer because you know, if as Stewie says, we, we would have spoken about that. Listen. You know, you can go through and away goals was one all, so don't be panicking if you go a goal behind, whether that's early or late. But the second goal, then you know it's you know it's fairly uphill from then. Yeah. Um it wasn't all bad news though, because despite going out of the Champions League, you dropped into the uh, UEFA Cup and you were drawn against Lille, the French team, who again were a, a very good side and a, a difficult one and a home leg a, again first two all draw, and again, two late goals. Again, yeah. maybe just showing that the, the fitness levels must have been really high. Yeah, I think Glenn had got injured in the game against Hajduk Split, if I'm not mistaken, in the second leg at, in Dublin. And he'd been struggling a little bit. And then we were 2-0 down. Um, and I, I was I was actually suspended because I got sent off late on in Deportivo. Um, and and uh, a funny story, we, I was um, on the radio with Eamon. Eamon Collins was the, was took charge of the game that night and I was up in the, in the stand. We we're two 0 down at half time, and I was, I was hopping because I couldn't get down. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. So, I, I, I trying to get through to Eamon on the walkie talkie where I was them days. I wasn't it is now, but I couldn't get him, and it was all sort of yeah, yeah, yeah you know, like a bad <laughs> fight. And as I rang him, he he, he said to me, "Pat, you'll just hang on for a minute. There's fucking more to go on in this dressing room. Just give me up." And I could hear he didn't hold. We just put the fan. It was pandemonium. It was chaos. I think it was. Uh, I'm sure it was Joseph, maybe. Owen, Owen, Owen and Joseph. Owen and Joseph. Joseph, right. And uh, so I, I left Eamon at it, and obviously we, we, we came back. Our second half performance was really good, really good. But I still maintain, I've said this previously as well, they were the best side we played mm. in European games for me. Technically, ability was they had, they were a really, really good side. Really. And even going the France, I thought we're gonna to have to be out of here. We're gonna get, we're gonna get really tongued, you know, because I thought they were, uh, they had real quality all over the pitch. Players were, were top, top class. But again, it was a brilliant second half performance from us in Dublin. We really, you know, it was a, and, and, 
another one pad I came on and set up the two goals how why did you That's not bring happened. me on in the other games man, for fuck's sake you, you, for you, fuck's you would, sake man Con, Con, Con would remember this you are my David Fairclough Alan <laughs> without the red hair yeah, yeah the red I'm, hair, better, yeah. I'm better looking at him anyway yeah <laughs> speaking of red hair Glenn Fitzpatrick scored a couple of great goals uh, that night and, and it gave you uh, half a chance going to um, France in the second leg yeah, it did. It, it, you could see the two goals. You're obviously, but like I said, they they were they were a really good team. They they had top top players at the time and uh, young team as well. Um, I'm not saying he gave us a lesson over there, but they were really decent. I thought yeah. at home. Um, they won two 0 at home. I mean, yeah, actually, again, I was looking at their record and they went on to the group phase and they but, topped they, their group. Bet Man United yeah, as well. Yeah, the group yeah, stages, Con. I remember um, that well. Yeah, a lot of and they knocked uh, Basel out in the knockout phase afterwards as well. They yeah. only went out actually in the round of sixteen to another French team. Obviously, there, a local derby, one nil over two legs, could have gone either way. So, so they were obviously very good. I have a, um, I have a, I have a lovely jersey framed down home, uh, the Lille one actually, and uh, the program in it. I was only looking at it down at Christmas at the weekend uh, or over Christmas. And just looking at some of the names and parts of the mid- midfielders, there's a little lad, Jean McCoon. McCoon um, yes, yeah, let's say to field, brilliant player. P- a young Adam Peter, Adam Wingy was with them as well, I yeah. think, at the time, he Peter was, yeah. Adam Wingy. Um, yeah. But they did, they had serious quality then. They were very, very good. But we were exhausted, Con. It, it was late September. Yeah. You know, we it, we were, so like, in terms of your body clock, your, and I, um, I always, I don't know uh, whether the lads agree with us or not, but I always found that my body was so in tune to a football season, like even the day after the season was finished, I would be in aches and pains. I mean, muscles would be in aches and pains. I think it's a psychological thing as well. I think you sort of train your body to, 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 um, to, to, um, for the season that's there. And we were, we were late September. We were, you know, we were coming towards the end of the domestic season. We were just exhausted. You know, mentally as well, I think we were exhausted, and uh, I don't think we put up a, a, our best show against against Lille. But mm. they were, uh, I agree with Alan. They were, or with, uh, with Pat as well. They were, they were, t- they were top side. They were obviously a team on the up because when you subsequently look at what they went on to achieve in the Champions League groups, they just yeah, um, yeah. they were top team. You know, an indication, all right. Uh, just a reminder, by the way, that uh, in the Republic of Ireland residence. Uh, in the Republic can watch uh, every Champions League game for free on the uh, live score app. And I mean, after that Champions League campaign, there was the following or the season after the, uh, the league win in 06, um, beating Glen Torren in the first qualifying round, going out to Stoy at Bucharest um, 4-1 over two legs. And that was a pretty unhappy uh, sort of occasion. I think, had you gone at that point, Alan, or were you still there? Yeah, I was gone at that stage, yeah. So Stewie and, uh, and Pat, you were out in, in Bucharest and we yeah. saw, you know, the ugly head of racism raising its uh, head. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't, uh, it, was, it was a tough, I'd, I'd played in Romania, gone back with Pats um, and Bowes. We played Stow, Bowes and Dynamo with, with Pats in European competitions, but the night we played Stow in, in with Shells was a, uh, wasn't wasn't good, I have to be honest. And uh, it was a nice and um I remember being on the bench and the, the 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 everything bouncing off the bench wherever they were thrown, but it was it was a it was a hostile night, but they had a good side as well. They they, they, had, they had some really good players and it was really warm night, I remember. And no, we, we never the game in the game in Tolku again was a lovely evening and obviously there was a hell of a lot of Romanians came to the game that were living in Ireland. There was a big, big crowd at the game and yeah. Uh, still big rest fans so it was a good occasion but um, no we, we just came up against better quality there yeah. the, again getting through the first round with Glen Torren obviously gives you that uh, little bit of a platform that you've gone through the whole that you're expected to go through we won easy I think over the two legs um, but we, we came up against a decent stale team there. I, 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 I frustrate the, I, I have a bit I the away leg frustrated me a little bit because I again I ha, I I felt we were we were coming you know you know I thought we we brushed Glen Torn away to the side quite easily in Tolka and I felt we, again we were starting to we were in that mould and the, even even the game against uh, Stowa at at home I thought we could have nicked it actually Ollie could have had a little header late on the game and could have nicked it but again you're going away thinking could we could we repeat what we did and then Roger gets involved with Dika. Mm. Um, and there's a bit of needle. They were at. They were, I don't know. I don't know what happened that day. The two of them were at it right from the start the of the start, game. Yeah. Right from the start. And Dika was was Romania's probably top centre forward, and they were at it, at it, at it. And the two of them, whatever, came together, and the referee sent both of them off. Mm. Now you're thinking we're both down to ten men. 
that we couldn't replace Roggie because mm. we had to. I, I had to go back centre half, and we had to shift around midfield, and it just uh, affected us. And then, the, the, but the stuff that happened in the second half was, or um, for uh, with the crowd was 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 absolutely mm. awful. Like you know, I mean, Curtis had been playing as well, and he was getting a lot of stick, but he was over the far side. And I think the, the I don't know if if my memory's right, Pat. The, the the nasty crowd seemed to be on the the, the, the dugout side, was it? Yeah, behind the dugout, yeah. And yeah. then when Joseph came on, it just went to a different level altogether. Yeah, did you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Scumbags altogether. They got a fine of sixteen thousand pounds. But, but Con, it, just it, it wasn't the first the time. They, they have been repetitively <laughs> fined. But well, just yeah. on that, that that was probably the foot, toughest draw we could have got at that stage. They were, I think, they were the top seed that we could play against. So. Yeah. Not, not making excuses, but it was probably the hardest. When you look at, you know, when you go to Europe and you think, well, you look at who you could get and you think, and right, well, they're the seed one you don't want to get. Yeah. And unfortunately, we did. Uh, but they, um, again, they, 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 were, uh, they were just too good for us on the night. Just before we wrap up, um, can I ask the three of you for your thoughts on what happened post that great 04 05 campaign for Shelburne? Because, you know, you were close to the group phase and the holy grail and the financial windfall. It didn't happen. Then we had the financial crisis. The house of cards came down. Shelburne, the, the whole uh, shell story turned pretty sad, really, and they were relegated. I know they're back now under Damien Duff and they've exciting times ahead, but it was really kind of the end of an era in a way. Yeah, it was. It was, it was, it was really difficult times. I think I'd spent probably eight, nine years of shells up till then. I think it was coming into maybe the tenth season as a player and as as a manager. Um, I mean, you're at a club that long. Obviously, you get to you get to have feelings for it and you get close to people in there. And it was just it was just it, that that season was really really difficult. And I've said this before and I go right. The players that season were incredible. You know, to do what they did on the back of where everything was because people don't haven't got a clue what went on. Um, <laughs> that were probably in in the dressing room at the time and. To be able to maintain your dignity more so than anything else when you, you're not getting paid for a long period of time and you're a full-time player. But to be able to then focus and concentrate, to have something to achieve, to win something, when really at the end of the day, I'm not saying it didn't matter, but it wasn't be on end all for everybody because there was obviously bigger problems when you're, you, you haven't been paid for a long period. Of time. So I don't think that team for that year ever got the credit it deserved, to be honest. I think they were... You know, to go on and do what they did under them circumstances was incredible. It was just a horrible time for everybody. Not like it was a horrible time for everybody at the club, whether it's players, staff, supporters, people involved. It was just we had built we had built so much. We thought we had put in really good structures. We had a very very vibrant academy um, in the club as well that we built. Um, like I said, we were doing a lot of things prior to I hear clubs talking about what they're doing now but a long long time ago when we were at shells that, that all that stuff was going on and when you see all that fall and, and just crumble it's it, it is difficult um and it was difficult but it was a really difficult time for but I'd, I'd still have to say the players to that season what what they achieved was uh was phenomenal i remember the 06 win as being my best achievement in football really Con, yeah 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 without a shadow of a doubt um purely because of what pat said it was awful it was an awful time. Um, we had problems with wages from pre-season. We, you know, and we knew. Um, and you know, again, there was so much investment from the players into that into that project, into that into that that team. Um, and again, going back to that thing, it's just such a rare thing to get in football, you know. And and we had it. We had it. And I think what happened was we could see, we could we knew it was gone. We knew it was gone, like you know, and then things that happened. I mean, just everything went against us that year. There was the Dublin City's things, and there was player suspensions, and there was all sorts of stuff. It just never, it was relentless. It never stopped, yeah. like you know. But from the players, the reason I think it, it was such a huge achievement for us was because um, we knew it was gone. Yeah, we knew we 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 did this is this is, we're in trouble here, and I think rather than you know. I'd like to think that in, in, in modern age, my players might feel a little bit sorry for themselves and look to get out. Never, I think we had a different reaction. We said, "Well, do you know what? It's gonna go. We're gonna win it." Mm -hmm. And like literally, we had like I mean, I, we fell over the line, absolutely fell over the line. But got there in the end, and I, 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 I think it's probably the, the, it was my certainly my greatest 
uh, achievement in football. I, I look back at that year very, you know, with a lot of fondness for the club and mm-hmm. for all the for, for for Pat and for the team teammates that we had and the effort that we put in. Like you know, like um, I think. I think it, that was it, Con. It never, yeah. it never got. It doesn't get. It didn't get any better after that. Like you know, to be honest. Maybe lessons though, Alan, for other clubs subsequently afterwards. You know, just to manage things a little bit more um, carefully, I suppose, financially. Yeah, maybe Con. Like you look at the way things are run now, and I think we are in a better place. All the clubs, to be fair. Um, but it's just sad that maybe it takes a couple of those stories to to eventually for people to maybe realise the way things should be done. Um, so that's a bit sad, but I think you should always, particularly Pat and all he achieved at Shelburne, and it's to me as a, as obviously we're involved in the league now, commenting on the league, and we love the league, and um, and we're very fortunate to do that. We've always loved the league, but Pat should be still managing in the league. Like it's a crying shame, really, when you think of um, that he's not. Because for me, I look back on my time. I won a league there. It was that season, the European stuff. So I have a lot of happy yeah. memories, but it's tinged with so much sadness for me as well, Con, in the sense that. I had such high hopes going in there and was so happy to be there. And Pat, it was a, it was a real honour for me that Pat wanted to sign me. And at the time, it was a big sign of myself and Glenn Fitzpatrick. Um, and we spoke about Glenn, how well Glenn did as well when he went there. And it just started off so bad and through no fault of my own. And then obviously he had to come back from that. We won the league, it was great. So I, I, I'm not one for looking back with any regrets. I look back and think, to be managed by Pat was a great honour for me to be involved with Stewie, who's a friend now is, and always has been. But just to be in that environment that we're honestly con. And I know you could speak to 100 players tonight that all have different views on different teams to play with. That was the best dressing room I was ever involved in. I was involved with good lads at the UCD in terms of good people and friends. But that was the best dressing room in terms of the level of player, the quality, the professionalism, um, the hunger, everything about it. And there were great lads. Owen Harry, I always say, was probably the best player I ever played with. Wesley was the best gifted player. Owen, for what he was given. Owen Harry was playing. The way he played on a Friday night, he was doing that on Monday morning and training on Tuesday. And as I say, I look back on that time. And, and basically, with, with it was the first time I realised what it took to be a professional footballer. Yeah. Because of the examples that Pat, Owen Harry, Stewie, Jim Crawford, that these people were setting. It was brilliant time, I, I, I honestly, and it was a it was a pleasure to be involved in Con. Yeah, brilliant time and and great memories. And and listen, lads, thanks a million for sharing them with us. Uh, it was a such a memorable time for Shelburne and for all of you guys. And uh, congratulations again on a brilliant run, which we all enjoyed. It's great nights in Tolka Park, uh, going to those games and enjoying them. Uh, must have been great to have been playing and managing in them as well. So Pat, uh, Stuart, and Alan, thanks a million for talking to us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Con. Thanks, Con. Cheers, Con. Thank you.